Right, good morning. Jake's here from Solid Ground. Uh, just welcome to you. Thanks for joining me today. And uh, I have the privilege of preaching. And um, yeah, just uh, hope to encourage us as a church. Hope to encourage you. If you're listening, uh, there's an amazing story in the book of Luke chapter 5, which we're going to work through today. In 2019, we were told to stay away from negative people. Then 2020, we told, we told to stay away from positive people. And now come 2021, we told to stay away from all people. So I don't know about you, but this year and last year has been a roller coaster of a year. We've had some good times, but also some very, very challenging times. People have lost loved ones. Uh, we've got many friends who aren't, aren't well. People have been affected. Their businesses have been affected. Relationships, marriages. There's just been a whole ton of stuff that has been happening. And my heart for us this morning is that uh, through, as we work through Luke chapter 5, that we would be reminded to keep our eyes on our Savior, to keep our eyes on Jesus and to allow Him to speak into our lives. There's a program that we used to watch a while ago. I don't know if it's still on TV, but it's, it's called uh, I Shouldn't Be Alive. And if you haven't watched it, it's basically about uh, true stories of people who have survived some incredibly difficult circumstances. Um, and so these stories get reenacted. And um, so some of the ones that I can remember, I remember there was a story once of a father and his 11-year-old daughter. And they went snowmobiling uh, somewhere in Canada. And they went for hours and hours into the middle of nowhere. And uh, they ended up having an accident and the father broke his legs. They fell into a ravine and the father broke his legs. So now you have a father with broken legs stuck in a ravine and uh, his 11-year-old daughter with him. And, and there's a decision that needs to be made. Do they just stick around and hope somebody finds them? Or does this 11-year-old girl go on a journey now on her own through the snow to go and find help. Um, there's another story of a, of a, a British man who was uh, sailing a yacht uh, across the Atlantic Ocean and he ends up having an accident. His, his, it goes through a storm and his yacht capsizes and it sinks but he manages to get onto a inflatable lifeboat and um, with a handful of supplies, a little bit of water, a little bit of food to keep him going and uh, he's floating out at sea. He gets attacked by sharks. The sun is beating down on him for days. The birds are trying to pick his eyes out. And he survives for 76 days. Think about that. 76 days out at sea on your own with a handful of supplies. And he, he manages to make it through. Um, another story is a, um, a British man who decides to go through the Amazon jungle. Um, he gets kidnapped by these guys and, um, and they, they, they only feed him every three, four days with scraps of leftovers. They lock him up in this cage and he manages to escape and he ends up tracking for six months through the Amazon jungle and he makes it out at the end. Uh, I don't know if I told you, but that 11-year-old girl, she did find help and her, her and her father were rescued. But it's just amazing that when we're in a difficult circumstance that we can do some incredibly uh, stretching things to get ourselves out of it. Uh, in a desperate situation, we can end up doing desperate things to get ourselves out of it. And Luke chapter 5, we, we read of a story of four friends and a paralyzed man who do something quite desperate to see their friend getting saved or to see their friend getting healed. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Luke chapter 5 and I'm going to be reading from verse 17. So it says, One day Jesus was teaching, <clears throat> and the Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. And some men came, carrying a paralyzed man on a mat, and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, Who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and he asked them, Why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk. 
But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. Immediately he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. What an amazing story. There's so much in that. Um, I want to encourage you this week, go home and read, or if you're at home now, stay at home, read Luke chapter 5. And there's just so much in there that I know God wants to speak to us about. And I'm going to unpack this. Uh, I'm going to break it up into a few sections, make some comments and give some thoughts. And then I want to leave us with two things to take home. Just two practical things that I think we can uh, learn out of this. So verse 17 says, One day Jesus was teaching. Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. And so we have this guy or this man, Jesus, who's going around and he's been raising the dead. He's been healing the sick. He's been uh, performing amazing miracles. And you can imagine people are looking now. They're like, hey, who is this guy? I want to go and see what it is that he's on about. And so Jesus finds himself in a house. We don't know whose house it is, but this place is packed. And uh, it's, it's packed, packed, packed. And the, the Pharisees, the Bible says that the Pharisees and the teachers of the Lord, these religious men, they were sitting there. And we know they weren't there to learn from Jesus. Why? Well, we know that they were quite arrogant and proud. Also, the Bible says that they were sitting in the house. Now, today, if you're a teacher, you stand and your students teach, uh, your students sit. But in those days, a teacher would sit down and a student would stand. And so if you go into a room and the teachers would be sitting down and the students would be standing. So these guys, these Pharisees, these religious teachers, they come into the house and they're not standing because they're not there to learn from Jesus. They're there to teach Jesus a few things. So we see them in the one corner of the house, Pharisees sitting they're there to teach. And on the other side of the house, we see Jesus uh, sitting as well. He's there to teach. So we have a bit of like a, what you would call a standoff, but we would call it a sit-off between the Pharisees and Jesus. They're there to try and trap Jesus. They're there to see, see if he puts any foot wrong, that they're there to trap him and to catch him and to prove that he isn't who he says he is. But I also like that the verse says that the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. The power of the Lord was with Jesus. And that's encouraging to me. Why? Because even Jesus relied on the power of the Lord. He relied on the Holy Spirit to do what God had called him to do. And that encourages me and it should encourage you. Because the Bible says that the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you and I. So just as Jesus performed miracles and he went about uh, healing and doing good and serving, that he did that under the power of the Holy Spirit. And that same power of the Holy Spirit lives in you and me. And we can go about doing things through the power of the Holy Spirit, even today. So we have Jesus in somebody's house. The place is packed. And um, we've got two groups of people. We've got people who are there to condemn Jesus. And we have people who are there to learn from Jesus. So verse 18, here we go. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles in the middle of the crowd, right in front of Jesus. The New Living Translation says they dug a hole through the roof. They dug a hole through the roof. The ESV says they removed the roof. So this wasn't just a little, oh, well, let's just make a plan. Think about it. They dug a hole through the roof. Imagine this for a minute. So imagine you're the owner of this house and you think, hey, man, Jesus is coming. I'm going to invite maybe five or six of my friends. We can sit around the table, have a bit of a and a with Jesus, a small little brekkie, you know, like an intimate little setting, just me and my buddies. And we won't tell anybody. We can spend some quality time with Jesus and he can just, you know, speak. And we can ask him all sorts of questions. I don't know. Maybe that's what they had planned. But it wasn't long that this guy's house became packed with people. In fact, that you couldn't even get through the door. People were crowded outside. They were there nobody, there's no standing space, let alone sitting space inside this house. So now you're there and Jesus is teaching. The place is packed. You're sitting in your lounge. And then the next thing you hear this banging and scratching and digging coming 
from the roof and you're like what is going on now there's my house is full of people now i hear the scratching and banging on the, on the roof then you start feeling stuff falling from the ceiling and then it's mud and grass and sand and branches and you're like what is going on the next thing there's this massive hole in your roof huge i mean imagine how big that hole would have had to be to lower a man on a mat into your lounge so they make a big mess. Next thing you see these guys, like a scene from Mission Impossible, this guy's getting lowered down into your lounge and he lands up on the floor right in front of Jesus. I mean, are you being serious? Is this really, really happening? These four friends, imagine what is going through their mind. They're thinking, we just got to get our friend to Jesus. Now in those days, they would have a roof that was flat and it would be made out of mud and straw and sticks and whatever. They weren't concerned. They weren't thinking, oh, what is this guy going to think? You know, it's his house and he's going to moan at us. They were like, I don't care what it takes. It's a desperate situation. I don't care what it takes. We have to get our friend to Jesus. Because if we can get our friend to Jesus, he can do something about it. He can heal him. Charles Spurgeon said this of, their, of these four friends. He said they needed to be strong for their burden is heavy. They need to be resolute for their work will try their faith. They need to be prayerful for otherwise they labor in vain and they must be believing or they'll be utterly useless. So here we have this paralyzed man lying on a mat in a packed house right in front of Jesus. Verse 20, when Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. And I like it. He says there, Jesus saw their faith. He saw their faith. Now think about that. There was something that visible that Jesus could see about their faith. They not only just believed in Jesus, but they did something about it. <clears throat> he saw their faith. And they believed that they could just get their friend to Jesus. He could heal him. Then Jesus' words are, friend, your sins are forgiven. Now, I can pretty much guarantee that that's not quite what they wanted to hear. <clears throat> they wanted to hear, get up and rise up and healed in the, name, in the name of Jesus or something like that. But Jesus' first words were, friend, your sins are forgiven. And maybe the paralyzed man was like, okay, thanks. That's, you know, it's better than my thin, sins are not forgiven. But I don't know if you can see, but I'm paralyzed, you know. And if, if you could do something about that, that'll be great. You know, we can get to the sin stuff later. But for now, if you could just maybe just heal me, you know, and, and we can take it from there, you know. Then verse 21, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? And it's exactly, that's true. They were right. Only God can forgive sins. And the light should have come on there. Well, if this man is forgiving his sins, well, then he must be God. But they didn't see that. They thought he was being blasphemous. They're like, who is this guy? He, now he's, he's trying to raise this, heal this guy. And then he says, your sins are forgiven. I mean, who does this guy think that he is? The thing is with, with, with forgiveness is that you can only forgive someone if they've sinned against you. Right? So Jesus is saying that this paralyzed man has sinned against him. And so that's why he is offering him forgiveness. I'll give you an illustration. Say, for example, your car gets stolen and they catch the guy. They catch the thief and um, I come up to you and the thief is there. The police have caught him and I look at the thief and I say, you know what? I forgive you. I forgive you. You would be like, what? <laughs> it's my car he's stolen. How can you forgive him? It's my car. I'll forgive him if I want to, but it's not your place to forgive. And so that's exactly what Jesus was saying. He was saying, this man hasn't sinned against anybody else, but he sinned against me. And this ruffled their religious leaders' feathers. They were like, "Who? this guy's saying that he is God. Then it goes into saying, verse 22, Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, why are you thinking these things in your heart? And isn't that quite vulnerable that Jesus, he knew what they were thinking? Now imagine I'm thinking something and all of a sudden Jesus says, hey, I know what you're thinking, you know, X, Y, Z, blah, 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 whatever. I'll be like, what? Okay. You know, he knew exactly what they were thinking. And he says, why are you thinking these things in your heart? In verse 23, Jesus says, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, 
get up and walk. So let me ask you today, what do you think is easier to say? Not easier to actually do, but easier to say. Do you think it's easier to say your sins are forgiven? Or do you think it's easier to say, get up and walk? Well, what if I had to bring up somebody next to me who's in a wheelchair or they are paralyzed and I say to them, uh, your sins are forgiven. You can't prove whether that's happened or not. There's no evidence. There's no, well, how can I prove it? You know, so you just got to believe me. But if I had to say, get up and walk and this man doesn't, then I look like a mampara because <laughs> then I'm obviously lying. And so Jesus asked him that question. What do you think is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or get up and walk. And so the Pharisees thought Jesus was looking for the easy way out. Because if he had said to the man, your sins are forgiven, they wouldn't have been able to prove Jesus wrong. They would have just have to believe. Oh, well, he said it. So, you know, or they thought, well, he's lying because how do we know he did it or not? But if Jesus had to say, get up and walk, and this man doesn't get up and walk, well, then they could prove him wrong. So it is easier to say your sins are forgiven because you can't prove me wrong. It's more difficult to say get up and walk because if that person doesn't, then you know that I'm full of nonsense. But if Jesus was lying, if Jesus first said your sins are forgiven and he was lying and then he asked, then he told the man to get up and walk, I don't, God would not have honored his word. God would have, if Jesus was a liar or a, a con artist, God would have said no. Why must I make him get up and walk? You've been lying about forgiving people's sins. But Jesus forgives him. And the evidence and the proof and the fruit thereof is this man getting up and walking. And this infuriates the Pharisees and the the religious leaders at that time. So imagine the tension in the room at that moment. The scribes were tense because Jesus had challenged them. The paralyzed man was tense because he wondered if Jesus was actually going to heal him. The crowd was tense because they sensed the tension of everybody else in the room and they were wondering what is actually going to go on. The owner of the house was tense because his roof had been ripped off. The four friends were tense because they're like, okay, are you going to heal this guy or not? The only one who wasn't tense in the room at that moment was Jesus. Verse 24, Jesus goes on to say, But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And then he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, Get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on, and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God, and they were filled with awe and said, We have seen remarkable things today. I want us to take home two thoughts. I want to leave you with two things this morning. Number one, I want to ask a question. Whose voice is the loudest in your life? right now whose voice are you listening to the most right now we don't know much about this paralyzed man all we know is that he was brought there with four friends but he could have been lying he could have been put on the side of the road or the corner of the street every morning begging trying to make a way for himself he he obviously wasn't working he was absolutely vulnerable um uh, you know, maybe people have mocked him. Maybe th- people thought, oh, he's just lazy. You know, he's just acting. You know, you know sometimes we, we get to a traffic light and you, you see somebody and you're thinking, ah, oh, you know, he's begging. But you're thinking, I don't know if his leg's really broken. You know, he looks like a con artist. I don't know. Maybe, maybe people thought the same thing about him. What if he was brought before the Pharisees? What do you think they would have said to him? You know, maybe they would have said, well, you paralyzed because of the sin in your life. You've obviously done something wrong and now God is punishing you with being paralyzed. But what were Jesus' words to him? And I love Jesus' words. He says, friend, your sins are forgiven. Friend. He calls him a friend. That's his first words. Not man or person. He says, friend, your sins are forgiven. And we know in John chapter 3, verse 17, it says, For for God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. God did not send His Son to condemn us, but to save the world. And that's Jesus' words to Him. Friend, your sins are forgiven. The most important need in His life and in our lives is the need for forgiveness. Healing will come. 
and answered prayer will come. But the first most important thing is forgiveness. And uh, we need to make sure that Jesus' voice is the loudest voice in our lives, especially through the year that we've been through and even through what we're going through right now. We need to make sure that Jesus' voice is the loudest voice in our lives right now. Not social media, not the news, not what scientists are saying, or even what doctors are saying, what the world is saying. I enjoy reading the news, but I know I read too much of it, and I, I get distracted, and I get depressed, and I get down. I'm like, hey, I've got to get with Jesus. I've got to hear the Father speaking to me. I've got to hear Jesus' words over my life. I don't know if you've ever tried to talk to your kids while they're doing something, maybe playing TV games or watching a movie. It's like they don't hear a word that you're saying. I know I've, I've tested it before. I've said to them, hey, look here, and then the kids are watching a movie or they're playing TV games, and I'll say, hey, do you want some ice cream? And they wouldn't hear a word. Hey, do you want some pocket money? And they'd be like, well, whatever, because they're so distracted. They don't even hear a word that I say. When, when our kids were young, I remember I, I would, I'd have to grab them, you know, just take them and, 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 and turn their heads and say, look at me. Look at me. Look into my eyes. If I want to get the attention, I would say, look into my eyes and let me, I need to tell you something important. I would say, I love you or you are precious or, or whatever it is that I need to make sure that they're looking at me so I can speak to them. And there have been moments for me and I'm sure for you in this whole lockdown thing, you know, I'm over it and it's been hard. It's been challenging. And there have been moments where I've lost it. I've lost my temper. I've been frustrated. I've been angry. I've been impatient. I've been grumpy, you know, and then I look back and I realize, actually, why? Why? Why am I feeling like that? Because it's because for me, because I've lost perspective. I've seen so much of everything around me that I've forgotten to, to look up to my Heavenly Father. I've forgotten to hear His voice over my life. I love what David says in Psalm 121. He says, I lift up my eyes to the mountains. I look up. I don't look down. If I look down for too long, I'm going to get so distracted and down and depressed. He says, I look up to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of the heaven and the earth. So I want to I say, whose voice is the loudest in your life right now? And make sure that that voice is Jesus' voice. Not the news, not social media. But make sure that Jesus' voice is the loudest in your life right now. And then number two, I want to ask, are you adding works to your faith? Now don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we can earn our salvation by doing works. We know that salvation is a gift. It's free, undeserved. There's nothing we can do. You can serve God for the rest of your life. You can pray for the sick. You can read your Bible. You can fast. You can pray. You can do whatever. No matter what you do, we know we can never pay God back. We can never earn our salvation. We, never, we can never do so much and we can prove to God that we deserve to be saved. We know that that's a fact. There's nothing you can do to earn your salvation. But at the same time, the Bible is very clear. You re, you're going to read the book of James. That faith without works is dead. It's a dead faith. It's not even a, a half limping faith or a hop along faith or just kind of getting by faith. Faith without works is dead. And those works are not to prove to God how much we love Him or to try and earn our salvation. It's a fruit of our salvation that we are saved. And because we are saved, we're saying, God, use me. Use my hands, use my voice, use my finances, use the things that you've given me. What is in my hand? Use that, Lord. Use whatever you've placed in my heart, the dreams, the desires, the passions. If it's to pray for the sick, if it's to feed the needy, if it's to visit the sick, if it's to visit the lonely, if it's to help somebody financially, if it's to give somebody a job, if it's to help somebody, whatever that is, God, what have you placed in my hand? I want you to use those things and add them to my faith. What if Noah just believed God would save them, but he never built the ark? What if Moses believed God would rescue his people, but he never actually went and spoke to Pharaoh? What if Rahab believed that she would be saved, but she never hid those spies? What if Jesus believed that he, his death would secure salvation for us, but he never actually went to the cross? There's a story I read of a Scotsman whose job, he had a little rowing boat and he, he would row people across this little river. And on the one oar he had faith engraved and on the other oar he had works engraved. And somebody asked him, why have you got these things engraved on the oars? And he said, well, if I only row with one, 
If I take one out of the water, we're just going to go in circles. We're not going to get anywhere. I need both to get me across this river. And so for us as believers, we need faith and works. James chapter 2, some challenging words. What good is it, my brothers, if someone claims to have faith but no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. And if one of you says to them, Oh, go in peace, I'm praying for you. And but does nothing about their physical needs. What good is that? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. And Jesus shared a similar story in the Gospels where he says, well, you know, I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you look after me. I was prison and you visited me. They said, Lord, when did we do that? He said, well, he says, I will reply, I'll tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And so I want to ask us today, what good work is God asking you to do? And don't underestimate that thing, even if it seems very small. If you think of those four friends and their paralyzed, those four friends and their paralyzed friend, you know, they could have stayed at home and thought, oh well, if Jesus wants to heal him, he'll heal him, you know. They're like, no, we've got to do something. In fact, they, they, they ripped off somebody's roof <laughs> to get their friend to Jesus. So don't underestimate what we do because God can take that and do the miraculous and He can do the, 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 yeah, the miraculous. He can do what we can't do. But we know the biggest need in that man's life was forgiveness. It wasn't healing. That was a need, but his biggest need was a need to be forgiven. And as I close this morning, that's our biggest need. Our biggest need is to know that we've been forgiven. And I want to ask you today, do you know God's forgiveness? Do you know that you have been forgiven by God? Do you know Jesus as your Savior? We can pray for you. We can drop off gifts. We can help you financially, all those kinds of things. But if you don't know Jesus, it's pointless at the end of the day. And so I want to ask you, do you know Jesus as your Lord and your Savior? If you don't, I'd love to pray with you today. So if that's you, I'm going to pray and just respond to Jesus in your heart as I pray this prayer. Lord, I come to you today. I thank you that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for me in my place. To die the death that I should die. To pay for the sins in my life. I thank you, Jesus, as I put my hope and my faith in you right now. That you've forgiven me. You cleanse me of all my sins, past, present and future. And as I confess my sin to you today, I become a child of God. That I'm loved, I'm cherished. So I thank you for my salvation today. And I pray, Lord, that you would use me to make a difference in the lives of the people around me. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer today, get in touch with somebody. Get in touch with a friend. Tell somebody, hey, I gave my life to Jesus today. I don't know what to do. Where do I start? We'd love to help you. You can contact us at our office. You can drop us an email. Message us on Facebook. Get in touch with somebody. We'd love to help you in your journey. I want to close with a psalm, Psalm 71.3. David says, be to me a rock of refuge to which I may continually come. He says, God, be that rock of refuge where I can return to time and time again. And as I close, I want to encourage you, spend time with Jesus on a daily basis. Let him speak. Let his voice be the loudest voice in your life. And allow him to remind you of the gift that he's placed in your hands and in your life. And, and, and may we use those things to make a difference to the people that we find ourselves around. People are going through some really, really tough times and we need to be there for each other. We need to support each other. We need to encourage each other. We need, the, we need to be the church that God has called us to be. We need to be the hands and feet that He's called us to be. So let God speak and let Him use you. And I'm trusting for miracles to take, in, to take place. I'm trusting for healing, trusting for people's lives to be changed and for people to come to know Lord Jesus. Amen. Thanks for being with me today. I hope you enjoyed our sermon and uh, yeah, I hope you have a fantastic week and uh, follow us on Facebook, Instagram.
get in touch with us if you're not receiving SMSs. And yeah, hope you have a fantastic week. Love you guys. Appreciate you. Ciao.